Hey. I haven't seen you in your uniform for a while. Yeah, that was uh, on purpose. Hmm, kind of turns me on. There he is, General Patton in a neon vest. Wow. <laughs> They say a half a million people watch the Boston Marathon here in New England. Oh, baby. Hey, you behaving yourself? to decide right, who's right. running this and we have to decide quickly it's terrorism we'll take it and let's get an evidence for it started right over there clock is ticking the world is watching the suspect seen on the surveillance cameras two bombers we gotta find these guys before they do this to someone else we can't have our citizens on the streets with all these threats every inch of this city is getting searched we're shutting it down. A taxi picked up a guy matching White Hat's description. Could be he's on his way to New York. Are there more bombs? Are there more bombs? I want a lawyer. No. No? I have rights. You ain't got shit, sweetheart. today good versus evil love versus hate there's only one weapon you have to fight back with it's love wrap our arms around each other i don't think there's any way that they can ever win Patriots say, let's hear it. I want to talk all about Patriots Day and most about Patriots Day, but I do think your other film, Deepwater Horizon, this, uh, this year complements this film very well in terms of your directorial style and how committed to, to reality, for, for lack of a better stylistic word, you are. It's beautiful. They're incredibly well made and they're taught. And I want to talk about how you find that in Patriots Day, how you stick to the facts in all of this. Um, well, you know, um, Mark invited me to come into Boston, which is his hometown, and um, meet people like Commissioner Davis, who were so involved uh, with the four days uh, from the time these two brothers blew up the marathon to the time these two brothers uh, met their well-deserved end. Uh, one was killed in Watertown, the other was, was captured on a boat. And I, I was able to, <clears throat> excuse me, spend a couple of months just researching, just meeting the folks of Boston, um, just regular, everyday people who acted extraordinarily heroically and were very inspiring. And from the time I spent with them, uh, I quickly realized that I didn't have to do much in terms of making anything up. It was an incredible story. Uh, these people are real, honest-to-God heroes. He doesn't have a cape, but he's got something under it, like a super, super, like a big ass, like a Superman thing that he doesn't show very often, but it's there. It's his heart. And I think that's one thing that you do really well in the film, is show regular moments suddenly upended by an extraordinary situation. And it makes the extraordinary all the more heartfelt and amazing when you're watching it, that you start with these regular moments. Mark, this isn't the first Boston movie that you made. Obviously, you love telling stories about Boston. It's really important to you. But when you set out to tell each one, what's the first thing on your mind about capturing Boston? Well, everyone, I mean, there's a big difference between, say, Ted and, you know, Patriots Day. Um, I'm, I apologize. I don't think Ted was on my mind in yeah, that, in well, that question. Well, that was the first Boston movie that came to mind, other than Patriots Day. But with a movie like this, it's no longer about your individual experience. You know, obviously, I had a huge uh, responsibility in getting it right. Um, once I was committed to making the movie, everybody wanted to communicate with me directly to tell them just how important it was to get it right, to understand what my intentions were. And then once I was able to communicate that, we really had the support of the community. 
Um, but you know, we are uh, we're extremely proud of how our brothers and sisters respond in the face of this tragedy, and we wanted to tell that story and and really kind of show people what Boston Strong means. Ed, uh, you are one of those brothers and sisters that responded in the face of tragedy and an extraordinary event. Um, if you could walk us through not the play-by-play -play or the moment-by-moment -moment of what happened, but how it felt responding to something so extraordinary. Did you realize that you were acting extraordinarily, or did you feel like you were just doing your job? No, I, I appreciate the kind words of uh, two guys that I admire very much and I've worked very closely with over the last year. But um, the truth is I was part of a big team of people that responded to this thing. And um, there were people that did a, a lot of amazing things. Uh, and the great thing about this film is I, I look at it as an opportunity to show uh, what can happen when the community and the police pull together. And that's really uh, an important component of it. Clearly, the victims are always first in our mind. And uh, they, were, uh, they were of great concern to me when we first started to talk about this. But both Peter and Mark um, shared that concern and were more focused on it than I ever could have thought possible. So uh, I think that overall, uh, for the city and for the, for the victims, this turns out to be a very important piece of work. Absolutely. Peter, when you're, when you're taking a real event like this and you're shaping it into an hour and a half, two hour movie, um, certain things have to be omitted, certain things have to be added to shape that story. How do you find the essential truth and stick to it and make sure the things that you have to sort of, I don't want to say change because not much is changed here, but the things that you have to work with that are different sort of maintain the central truth of the, of the incident? Uh, the, one of the remarkable things about the, the Boston bombing, uh, when I really took a good look at it, is, is probably no different than if you looked at, uh, unfortunately, any of these tragedies that are hitting us today in Orlando and San Bernardino and Paris. Unfortunately, this is part of the new world that we live in. And I think one of the problems for us is we're all so busy and we don't have time to go much beyond the headlines. So you, you know, wake up in the morning, you, you turn on your computer, you turn on your phone, you turn the TV and you see something's happened. <clears throat> Maybe you, you're, you're able, if you're lucky, to go look at it for 10 or 15 minutes and then you're on to the next uh, news story and you're on with your life. That's just the way life is today. Uh, by going deeply into this one event, I was able to meet people, and, and such extraordinary things happened. There was a, a young 24-year-old uh, Chinese-American citizen who'd been in this country for three months when he was carjacked by these brothers, and he's just one of the most intelligent, courageous, clever human beings I've ever met, and he used his wits to stay alive. An he, incredible storyline within the film. Uh, like I hate to interrupt you, but uh, I, I absolutely oh, no, love sure. that storyline from beginning to end, and that actor's performance is, yeah. is so great. Well, there's a guy named Danny Meng. Have you guys ever heard of Danny Meng? Anybody heard of Danny Meng? Okay, I do. I have. <laughs> okay, well, so none of you guys have heard of Danny Meng, which is understandable, because I don't know that I have. Danny Meng was carjacked by the Zarnayev brothers. They were the two terrorists. They took him to all his banks, got all the money out of his ATVs, uh, ATMs, took him to a gas station, filled up his car, his brand new Mercedes that he had worked really hard to buy, bought a bunch of food, put uh, Times Square in New York City in a GPS, loaded their car up with bombs, and they were heading down here to blow up Times Square. And this kid waited for the right moment, talked them out of killing them several times, and when the moment was right and it was his last chance, they were at a gas station about to head on to the freeway and come down here to New York, he uh, escaped in an extraordinary way and was able to alert the police, and the, and the police were able to get him. And it's, it's an incredible story. And that's one of many stories that, that I found when I, I did my research. And we didn't really have to change anything, you know? Uh, very small details compressing the time, but it's not like if I'm gonna go up to a man, a great man like Commissioner Davis and say, uh, you know, I'd like to tell your story but I'm gonna change everything, because I don't think it's that cool, whatever. <laughs> like, that would be kind of insane, right? So, for the most part, Mark and I, you know, worked very hard to meet the real people and just let the story tell itself, and I'm very proud of how, how accurate that story is. Mark, when did you realize that you wanted to be a part of this project? And were you worried before you were a part of it that other people would tell the story and not get it right? Yeah, I mean, there were, there were three movies that they were attempting to make, and, uh... You know, as much as I was on the fence, I quickly realized 
somebody else would do it regardless. And if it wasn't handled with the kind of respect and sensitivity that it deserved, it would be a big problem. Uh, considering the amount of violence, um, you know, it could easily have been a situation where somebody really exploited the community and it became gratuitous. And we didn't want that to happen. And I know uh, after working with Pete, how much he cares and how committed he is to getting it right and knows what that line is and where and when uh, uh, and what not to cross. And so for us, um, the other side of the coin was that, you know what, my, my, my community responded in such an amazing way and people from all walks of life, men, women, um, you know, ran towards the problem and showed uh, such great strength and, 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 uh, and were very heroic. And so I wanted, I wanted to share that. You know, I, need, I knew uh, people kind of saw the broad strokes uh, on the news, but they didn't really know the story of the people. And so, uh, you know, we were going to make sure that we took that responsibility on and uh, honor those people with, by telling their story. You have a, an incredible scene in the film in the aftermath of the explosion where you're with your wife and you break down and you're talking about all of the images that you've seen and that you're never going to get them out of your head. And now in that scene, uh, your performance is heartbreaking, uh, but it's also a kind of cathartic representation of what America and Boston was feeling in the aftermath of that explosion. Was it difficult for you to sort of maintain that performance as a character and not think about it as this character is representing, you know, the greater whole of every, what everybody experienced after the bombing? Uh, I think we just we, we were just wanting to play it real um, and having seen a lot of the real footage right before, uh, it was just a matter of telling Pete to roll the camera and then, you know, um, basically communicating to my to the woman playing my wife to Michelle what I had literally just saw and then also knowing that you know um, people people were hurt and people were knocked down and you know people lost limbs and some people lost their lives but everybody stood back up held hands and and were ready to fight again and uh, and that to me was it was it was all right there you know I think um, our job was easy considering what everybody else went through, but the level of commitment was never wavering. Pete and I knew that uh, the responsibility that we had, and you know, we knew that we were, uh, you know, we had to step up our game. Commissioner Davis, uh, when you were approached to sort of consult and you were interviewed about the film and talked to and be a part of it, what was one thing that you wanted to make sure the movie got that you told them this is really what I remember and this is a specific thing that I would like to see in the film. Did it make it in the movie? No, I'm sure it does. <laughs> um, after the victims, uh, which I already spoke about, the single most important thing was Boston Strong, that phenomenon, that, that feeling in the city that um, came about as we were in the middle of this pursuit for these guys. We, we were, um, there, there were 2,200 cops that worked for me, plus 1,000 other officers from different police agencies that were actively engaged in pursuing these guys. And in the middle of it, I started to hear about Boston Strong. And when we shut the city down, and everybody did exactly what we asked them to do, when we went to social media and crowdsourced, for the first time in history, we crowdsourced photographs and videos from people that might have been at the scene and asked them for their help. For the first time, people came forward and helped us with all of these things that we asked for. Shelter in place, give us the information you have, provide us with any uh, leads that you might have. It was an incredible... Uh, feeling. I wanted to get that Boston Strong feeling in there, and these guys nailed it. Peter, uh, in depicting the Sarnayev brothers, you do uh, a great job of not making them one-dimensional villains. It's really interesting the choice that you made, and it almost depoliticizes it to a certain degree, because you see them as kind of blundering fools throughout this who are incredibly dangerous, but they're also kids not unaware of what they're doing or it's hard to describe exactly what you do, but it's much more three-dimensional than I think most people would do. Can you talk about that? Um, I certainly didn't want to give the Zarnayev brothers too much attention. You know, the Zarnayev brothers are the two brothers who, who committed the crime. And I, I don't consider them to be um, uh, holy men. I don't consider them to be noble in any way, shape, or form. I don't think they were even really... Uh, Islamic freedom fighters. I think they were cowards. I think they were uh, psycho psychotic in their thought process. I think they were very narcissistic in their thought process. Uh, and, I, and I have absolutely no respect for them and, and, I, and, and less than no sympathy or empathy for whatever reasons 
caused a, caused them to commit this crime. I think they got what they deserved. Um, that being said, it is, I think, worth noting that these were not uh, guys who, like on 9-11, snuck into our country and you know blew up a bunch of airplanes. These were people who were going to college in, in Massachusetts. The older brother was working, training very hard to be uh, an Olympic boxer. He wanted a spot on our Olympic boxing team, and he was a very good fighter. They uh, were part of our culture. They were Americanized, and that, to me, was was bizarre. It was scary. Was confusing, um, and I felt worth noting. You know, we we hear a lot of talk about, you know, do we ban Muslims? Do we start cracking down on on various groups entering the country? And you know, that I'm not, I don't really have you know I'm, that's not the the focus of this movie, but it is worth noting. I think that these guys, you know, didn't just come into our country. They were raised in our country. They could be just like you and I, you might know somebody like this. And um, that made it very uh, <clears throat> interesting to me, who, you know, to, and I decided to, to spend a bit of time focusing on them. But certainly, uh, we were all very careful to make sure that they were presented as the, as the cowards uh, and, and actually the hypocrites, because they, they, they did not behave uh, in almost any way. They did drugs. The older brother was living off of his wife, which is uh, improper according to you know Muslim tradition. Um, one, the older one had committed a murder, uh, we think, several several weeks prior to the bombing. And I mean, these were just some bad kids. So. Well, like uh, like like many terrorists across the world, they're petty criminals who found a sort of disgusting purpose for their psychotic urges, uh, and they just happened to be sort of in uh, in Massachusetts at that time. Um, Mark, when you go to Boston and you start telling people that you're going to be a part of making a film about the Boston Marathon bombing, and Boston people are, are fairly vocal about how they feel about things, and someone says to you, you're going to get it right, what do you, what do you say to them? Uh, absolutely. You know, we, you know um, we, we've never been as committed to getting something right um, and making sure, you know, ultimately what we wanted to do is we wanted to honor everybody involved. Um, but, you know, that means really taking the time. And, you know, Pete and I, we've made two other movies, and we've never spent this much time. Certainly, I've never spent this much time, you know, in Pete's ear, uh, you know, fighting about things, you know, um, that I expected him to focus on and needed to kind of reiterate to him. And he, even though he got it, he was always still kind enough to listen to me, and he knew that I was, uh, I was feeling a lot of pressure. But um, yeah, I mean, every single person would make a point to come up and say, get it right, uh, and make us proud, but also show, show them who we are. And, and they knew what our intentions were, uh, and they were all extremely supportive. Yeah, the intentions are extremely sincere, and you can see it in the film. What was it like for you guys to recreate the, um, the actual bombing, the actual marathon? It's, it's an incredible sequence of, of film, not just within this film, but I just think of film in general. It's, in, it's insanely powerful. But I can't imagine what it must have been like to shoot that over the course of a week, two weeks, and sort of get that right, you know, on the streets. I think, um, you know, we film, uh, we film action scenes a lot in movies, and, and you know, we've, Mar Mark and I have certainly done some together, and we've done some apart. And action scenes are, they're really not as, as much, they're certainly not fun to film. They're slow and tedious, and you have to be very safety conscious. So, you know, we're, we're used to doing that. And in that regard, filming the explosion uh, at the marathon was, you know, more or less fit into the, the, the pattern of, of, of work that we're used to. What obviously made this different was that, you know, we, we didn't film the, the explosion in downtown uh, Boston on Boston Street. We didn't want to traumatize and, you know, freak everybody out. So we went out to an abandoned Navy base and built a giant set. And we had about a thousand extras show up that wanted to be in the scene. And very quickly during the course of the day, before we started shooting, people were coming up to me and, and to Mark also saying, you know, hey, I was there. My friend lost a foot. Um, I'm friends with, you know, one of the people who lost their lives, showing us their scars. And I suddenly realized, well, okay, well, this, this actually could, could be different, you know, because we're going to re be recreating this. And I had underestimated how, how concerned I would be that we would be doing this with people who really went through it. I, I didn't want people to be upset. And so every morning, Mark and I would sort of say, look, we're doing this. If anybody's upset, 
come find us. If you want to leave, you can leave. If you want to talk, we'll talk. And very quickly realized that nobody was, was upset and people were, wanted to be a part of it. And we had big PA systems and it was right at the time that Prince passed away. And I went to school in Minneapolis and I'm a huge Prince fan. And so, I, and I wasn't sure this was a good idea, but we started playing Prince music and people started to sing and people started to dance. Purple Rain? We played Purple Rain, but we played all, we played all kinds of Prince. We, a little red Corvette and a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, it was amazing to me how the mood became joyful. And we talk about Boston Strong, and the, the, that was when I was sitting on the uh, away, listening, looking at a thousand extras, all of whom were there at that marathon when it blew up and who had been hurt by that physically and emotionally. And they were on the set where we recreated this bombing holding their hands, singing the Purple Rain, smiling, wrapping their arms around each other. I really did believe in Boston Strong then, and I believed that, you know, one of the themes of this film is that they might knock us down, but we get back up, and we as a group of people are actually pretty good. Like, I believe if you were hurt, I would probably help you, and you would probably help him, and you wouldn't ask each other who you voted for, and you wouldn't care what color your skin was, or what sexual orientation you were, we generally just help each other. We're good. good. We're more good than we are bad. I saw that in Boston. I saw it when we were filming. And, you know, as a dad, I'm, I'm very proud to be able to, and I feel comforted being able to tell that story to my son. Commissioner Davis, uh, what was it like for you when you watched the film for the first time? Well, it's a raw emotional uh, feeling for me because I was there at the scene and the scenes are recreated, some of the victims are, are uh, recreated, um, and some of the things that we all did in response sort of laid out uh, in, in a way that I've never seen before. So it brings back bad memories. But in a way, it's cathartic. You, you get a chance to see this incident from other people's viewpoint. And, and I'll tell you, these guys did a more thorough job of drilling down into all of the components of this incident than investigators did. Investigators are focused on the elements of the crime and getting the proof to the jury, but, but they don't look at the human factor. They don't look at the Boston Strong part of it. They don't look at the courageous activities that occurred across a wide range of people, um, police, fire, EMS, citizens who were there. So they, they showed that. And, and I think what they did was they gave the general public a chance to see behind the curtain as to how complicated these issues are uh, whether it's in Boston or Orlando or San Bernardino or any place these things happen. And everybody's trying to do the best that they can, but they, complications ensue at times. The human systems, um, and, and, and I think this shows it. Peter, I, I want to ask, you know, because uh, we saw it in Deepwater Horizon, and we see it with, I think, starting with Friday Night Lights, a very specific stylistic choices that you make, or at least how you tell stories with these movies, which I think is so important, which is, you start with these beautiful vignettes of each character in an intimate moment in their life that is also just routine. You're gonna give away my secrets. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It works so well. Between us, I don't know. It works so well. Can you just talk about when you found that that, that works? Or did you even notice that that was a thing that works and that's just how you sort of instinctively tell stories? I, I think it is more how, how I instinctively tell stories that I have this kind of internal rhythm in my head and you know, I do a lot of research, and the research makes me fall in love with the people I'm telling the stories about, which kind of leads to me wanting to introduce those people slowly, so everybody gets an idea of who, who they're going to be experiencing for the movie, and then kind of push them into whatever hellacious concoction I've found, you know. It always ends up being something rather intense, and I keep joking that me and Mark are going to go just do a love story. And, Looking and, forward to and, that. In Italy on a beach, you know, and <laughs> relax and not do these intense films, but um, we keep being drawn to these kinds of stories. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has questions out here? Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my question's for Mr. Davis. Um, I was born in Lowell and grew up watching you on the news, and you kept your composure um, throughout the entire situation. And I just wanted to know, how do you approach press situations like this? Is it different? And how does it feel to be portrayed by um, John Goodman, such an accomplished actor? It, it's an incredible compliment that uh, 
these guys picked John Goodman um, as the person who portrayed me. He did an incredible job. He worked really hard at understanding what uh, the situation was and what I was going through. And I think he gets the complexity of the relationship between the different law enforcement agencies and the relationship between a police commissioner and the press and some of the, you know, the things that we're responsible for. So, uh, so thanks. And uh, Lowell's in the house. I love it. Yeah, nice, to, nice to see you. Uh, I was born and brought up there, just outside of Boston. Um, the, the, um, the press is difficult to deal with, um, it, but I've always been committed to transparency and getting the story out there quickly and, um, and, and, and honestly, because I truly believe that people, as, as Peter said, people are good, and if they understand exactly what's going on, you're fine. If you try to, if you try to, 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 to spin it, people catch that really quickly, so I try not to do that. And, um, and the, the marathon was intense. Um, the, the press coverage was worldwide. Uh, there were three times the number of people that are in this room in the first press conference I did, and then it just got worse and worse. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, intense uh, experience in, in trying to get the right story out there. Uh, but we just told them the truth, and we told them quickly, and we wanted people to protect themselves, and that's a formula for success, I think. Next question. Um, my question is for uh, Peter and Mark, but I do want to say thank you to Commissioner Davis for it's kind of you did. Great team. I had a great team. And uh, for, for you guys, I mean, you guys have, for me, become the premier filmmaking team for stories based on a true story. I mean, he mentioned Deepwater Horizon and Lone Survivor, which is some of the most affecting movies I've seen in the last few years. And so, you know, growing up, I felt like films, at least on the big screen, happened uh, you know, a longer period after the initial event. You know, you might see like a TV movie come out right after, but I think the turnaround time has, has shrunken down over the years, and I wanted to know what contributing factors you thought played a part in that, and what positive or negative effect you thought that might be having on the, on the material. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> well, I can't comment to whether there's a trend, you know, your, your theory with, uh, that there's, there's a trend. You know, I feel, it seems to me that there, there are a lot of period pieces um, that are being discussed for Academy Awards right now, and I'm, I'm not sure. You're, you're probably right, but I, I, I won't comment on that so much as what why we're doing those stories, because we are definitely doing stories that are more more current. Um, and I, I think, for me, it, it's just a question of taste. You know, I, I studied journalism in college and did a bit, uh, quite a bit of investigative journalism and took these crazy so, uh, social anthropology courses where we would be told to go to a bus stop for three weeks and write down and study human behavior at a bus stop, which you, you would think there wouldn't be a lot, but there's actually, the more you sp time you spend at a bus stop, you, real you would realize there are all kinds of incredible kind of codes and rhythms of behavior and codes of conduct, and, and that got me kind of hooked on the present. And um, when I was in college, I would do character profiles on you know, real people in, in my community, the mayors and teachers and good athletes and stuff. And I've just always been attracted to, you know, very current history, I guess. Um, it feels more immediate to me, more visceral. Um, and the kind of filmmaking I like to do, which, um, you know, we were talking about a little bit earlier, is is a pretty visceral. I want to I wanna be able to pull you into it and not let you just sort of sit back and, and watch it and check your phones and hit on your girlfriend or whatever it is you do in a movie. I want you to watch, right? And participate. And participate in the movie, not you're with your phone or your girlfriend. We want you to participate with, with the movie. And I, I guess I just feel more connected when I can go and meet uh, the real guy versus reading about him in a you know history book or looking at old YouTube videos. When I can sit with uh, Commissioner Davis and you know Mark took me so deep into the community then I just get real inspired. See, this is why I wanted to sit there, Ed, because Pete talks with his hands, so he's constantly like, he's going to punch me in the face. You know, Every time he points to you, he's about to punch me in the face. And he's punched me in the face before. I get passionate. And he's blown me up. Uh, as far as the, uh, the other thing that, I, well, the, the thing that people have asked me quite a bit is, is this particular story too soon? And Pete and I always felt like, no, considering what's going on in the world, turn on the news every day at somewhere else, and this message of love and us coming together uh, is it's not soon enough, and it needs to be seen and heard by everybody. So, Can you also talk about, um, there you go. If you guys want to give a round of applause, discussion. Yeah. 
can you talk a little bit about how you focus on these stories, going back to Lone Survivor and with Deepwater and with this, one thing that the, the two of you seem to focus on is the incidents at hand and focusing on those specifically and sort of removing all of the spin and politics that have happened in regards to these events at, in their aftermath. And you focus on the ordinary people within them and the extraordinary events. Yeah, I, I'm attracted to the idea of people doing their job. And my, my experience is, um, you know, whenever I'm really doing something, I'm not, I'm not thinking about politics. I'm not thinking about... Um, my, my social stands. I'm thinking about executing my job. You know, there was a real good movie about um, Sully, the captain that landed his plane in the river. And I promise you, he wasn't thinking about, it. he was thinking one thing, right? I'm going to land this plane in a river. That's, a, that's enough, you know? And if you'd been thinking about a lot, of, I don't think you would have done it. And I would bet, and I think we've talked about it a bit, sorry, when, um, <laughs> when, when something like this happens and... <laughs> he knows I'm not going to hit the commissioner. Oh, oh. Now you're going to make him self-conscious. <laughs> when, when Swing like this, away, Pete. When something like this happens, I don't think that you're thinking about anything other than doing your job, executing your job, making sure the victims are okay, making sure health is number one, and number two, going and getting these guys. And that's... Look, if you're on an oil rig and it blows up, you're not really thinking about the ramifications of drilling for fossil fuel at that moment and whether we should be spending more time with Elon Musk building electric cars and all that. You're about getting the fuck off the, the rig, right? And these soldiers in Lone Survivor weren't thinking about the war on terror. They were thinking about getting their brothers off the mountain. So I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think? Those are the, that's, that's what interests me, right? You're, you're in the moment in that situation, aren't you? Oh, without a doubt. I, when, when I got to the scene of the first bombing and, and I looked at the damage and the fact that these were improvised explosive devices and I realized that they were built to kill and injure people in, in my city, um, there was a minute where I was taken aback by it. And then um, you're, you're overwhelmed by a sense of duty and responsibility and you just, you know, sort of forge forward. Those are fascinating. What everybody's thinking and how they handle that challenge. I was just a small part of it. You talked to Jeff Pugilese, who actually uh, shot it out with Tamil and Sanayev in Watertown, and you hear his minute-by-minute -minute story. It's a fascinating story. And Mark, what about you and your approach to these stories? I'm with Pete. We're focusing on the people. The great thing about these movies, though, is obviously afterwards it will spark debate and conversation, and that's fine. Um, you know, people are asking, well, you know, did you plan on, you know, making this movie right after the election to be coming out? And no, I mean, that that's more of a coincidence. You know, we kind of focus on the people and telling the story. Um, it takes a year and a half to make a movie, <laughs> maybe yeah, two years. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, we're, uh, we're just focused on telling the story. Absolutely. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Um, hi, my question's for Mark. I was born and raised in Boston as well, recently moved here to study film and television in New York. Um, so I was wondering, what's one of the most memorable moments you had growing up in Boston, and what is a big takeaway you took from there that helped you thrive in these other places? Uh, you know, God, I apologized to the commissioner for all the trouble I caused as a youth. Um, <laughs> getting to know both sides of the law, actually, you know, and all my real life street life experience is, is now, I've been able to put that to good use and apply that to what I do. Um, I, uh, you know, but I think, again, taking, with this particular movie, um, and it's nice that you're coming here to study film, but make sure when you become a successful filmmaker, still go back and employ other people because there's so much great business here, but there's so many great stories to be told there as well. Um, but, you know, being able to now kind of have worked so hard to turn my life around and be able to go and sit in the commissioner's office as opposed to the holding cell at Station <laughs> Eleven. Um, all that real life experience, you know, has paid off. And I think, you know, um, as I continue to try to repent and grow as a person and as a father and as a husband and, and with my faith, you know, um, I think all that real life experience has allowed me to, uh, to get to where I am today. And anything that I missed as far as lacking in education, I can always go back and study and read and ask questions. Um, but those, those lessons that I learned uh, out there on the street figuring it out are invaluable. And I'm glad that I can now put those to good use. And good luck with your studies. 
Well, guys, I have to let you go. Patriots Day is fantastic. You did an amazing job. Commissioner Davis, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to meet you, sir. The film, when does it come out? Peter, when can people see the movie? December 21st, New York, L.A., and Boston, and then January 13th, wide everywhere. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you so much, guys. Patriots Day. Thanks, thank guys. you.